Welcome to Collaborators, a video podcast that explores the art of songwriting and creativity and aims to inspire artists to get dirty. My name is Jake Decker, and I'm a singer-songwriter. Join me as I tour across the U.S. to share my music and learn from the artists I meet about their songs, their stories, and the wisdom they've gained along the way. So, tell me a little bit about um, about your writing process, if there even is one, um, and like how you kind of prepare yourself for writing. I, I, I don't know. There's a, a lot of people, you know, I, you hear different methods for like songwriting, like as far as like, some people say write every day. And I'm just, I'm not built that way. I mean, I, I pick up my guitar and I try to pick it up every day. There, were, there was a, a long period of time where I didn't do that every day. Um, I at least pick it up and try to find something, but I can get into ruts where I play the same chord progressions over and over, or I, I have music that I've already written, and there's nothing to it, And um, but I look back and listen to some of the stuff I wrote years ago before I signed the publishing deals, really kind of started trying to write marketable stuff, which I'm horrible at, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I'm like, where did that music come from? And I think like, it was because there was no pressure. It was just like, oh, this, this is for me. But uh, for me, the, like, the pro- songwriting process really starts with just, like an idea. Sometimes it will start with a melody. Uh, usually it's, it's like a one-word title or an idea or something I'll sit on and I'm thinking, well, what does this mean? And uh, a lot of the stuff that I've been writing for the past, let's say, five or six years is just like, kind of like your throwback to John Denver or some stuff like that, where it's basically, it's very story-based. So you have a definitive starting point, middle, and then there's some type of resolution, at least for the most part there's a resolution in the song. And so um, for me it was always, where do I start that, where do I start the story at? How do I, you know, um, trying to think, like some of the songs will have a definitive character. So for me it was less about me as a songwriter, and it was getting you invested in the character in the song, which to me is a huge thing because um, I, I guess that's where my starting point is. I've got to find s- s- a person or some type of central figure that people can relate to, and this is their crisis or whatever, and this is you know kind of where they're sitting at the overall theme of it, and then this is kind of where we're sitting at as a resolution. And there's always some type of I always say I write on the seventy-five twenty-five rule. So seventy-five percent of the song is to get you interested in the story and invested in the character. The twenty-five percent is slipping in some type of a some type of an overall underlying theme, like I've got a song that's about the California Gold Rush. And uh, so, so the, the way the song is, it's about this guy and he goes out and, uh, you know, they, they move out to California and they, you know, they, block, they you know, find some land or whatever and they, you know, start, they dig a mine or whatever. And then the, the chorus is, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's diamonds in the dirt, there's treasure in the hills. And it says, just like every one of us, we're all the same but different still. You know, you peel away the, you know, the grime and you'll find the golden side. And so it takes that real story, that event, and it parlays it over into, you know, a existential thing, you know, where it's basically like, it's, it's, sometimes it's tough to find the really good things in somebody who's not really a good person that you see. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to find that gold or that treasure under them. So for me it was, here's, and, and even when I was writing that specific song, and that's, crude example, but even for me when I was writing that song, I didn't get to that nugget. That's not a pun. I didn't get that. It's not an intentional pun. I didn't get to that nugget until I was writing the course. I was like, oh, so this is what that song is about. I'm, I'm more now into the, the collaborating with other songwriters as far as co-writing. Um, it's hard to find songwriters, and everybody has their own thing that they do as a songwriter. For me, I'm a lyric guy. I feel like that's my best quality. I'm not necessarily a huge melody guy. I'm typically like C, G, and D, maybe some chord that I don't know what it is. It's a root of an F or something like that. But um, uh, for me, it's working the lyric. And I've been, there's a guy that lives here in town, him and his wife travel um, a lot. And so they have been living in Chattanooga for a couple years. And uh, he and I, probably about a year ago, I had heard him, I, I used to host a, um, a, a songwriter competition, kind of like what Eddie Owen does down in, in, in Duluth. It, it, we call it the Songwriter Shootout. Uh, 
and so very original. So uh, so anyway, so he had, they, he and his wife had just moved to, to Chattanooga, and I had heard his some of the songwriting, and I was just blown away because he was an actual wordsmith. I was like, this guy really, I can tell he spends a lot of time. He puts in the work. He spends the time. And so he and I, uh, with another guy, a, f- a friend of ours, I kind of sat in. They had started a song, and I sat in with them. And they uh, had already started writing a song. And so the next day, he and I had coffee. They were driving back from Nashville. And so we had coffee. He's like, hey, you want to go back to the apartment? They just a stone's throw from the coffee shop. So we went over to the apartment. He says, we can song swap. Well, the other guy shows up, you know, at the coffee shop. So we all three go back there, and I ended up helping them, you know, with the song. It was kind of like the first three-way co-writer I'd ever had. And I was like, okay, that's that's a that's pretty cool. And um, and so he and I scheduled some time, probably back in May, because I knew we had some of the same sensibilities when it came to how we work song, how we work lyric. And when we got together, I didn't realize I, I for the longest thought, am I the only one that doesn't do this brainstorming thing? And then I write lyric, and then we have a, a you know TA throwaway line at the end of a line, and then we move to the chorus and move as quick as we can. And he's doing the same thing I do when it comes to songwriting. I was like, this is fantastic. There's someone who works the same way I do, and it's just something I just have done over the course of the, you know the years I've been writing is figuring out what my niche what my niche was as far as and how I worked lyric and worked songs and. I think when it really was like I found a, a good co-writer was he said um, something I said you want to go to the course he goes no I like to work the lyric one lyric at a time I like to work a verse at a time and, and edit those down and then we go to the next and next and in my head I'm doing the, you know happy dance I'm like finally somebody else does the same thing I do as a songwriter so that was really kind of one of the things like okay this can work whereas I usually am an independent songwriter as far as like I'm really working independently but you get only that singular point of view when you do that, and uh, I've kind of point where I'm just like, you know, maybe it's time for me to, to branch out and co-write just because. And not all co-writes are going to go great. You know, you may get with somebody that's just it just doesn't work, and that's probably I think I've actually have been the beneficiary of some really good circumstances. Um, I haven't been uh, in a situation where it's just sitting there with somebody and it's just not working. With the last record I did, uh, Before the Bright Lights, it's kind of like, it was funny because a lot of the have been around for a while, and uh, I would, I'd have these ideas, and they all kind of just kind of formed. I have other songs that are not necessarily like that, but for me, it was always easier to remove myself from the story because it was less intrusive, which is not a good thing, because if you're a songwriter, you're supposed to be able to open your soul up and just bear it all. I can't do that. I just can't. I, for one, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of the cheese factor as far as like how really cliche it can be. And I listen to guys like Dave Ramirez, and, and I'm just like, how do you just bear your soul? But he's probably tortured. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, that's just the truth. Is As a songwriter, I mean, if you're really, I, there's only, I can say there's only two songs that I, that I currently have in a catalog that I will play that are super personal to me. And it's hard for me to play those songs because I'm like, my mind goes somewhere else. I, I'm just gonna lose it. I'm just, I'm just gonna lose it in the song. Whereas if I play these other songs that are about other characters, they have a little bit of me in those songs, but it's not about something personal to me, like you know, a fight I had my wife, or you know, my kids are acting like hellions or something crazy like that. I can sing those songs. They still have that. I still feel those, and they mean so much to me, but I'm not so much into them that I'm just gonna lose it on stage. See, that's the thing, it's, it's for me, it's, I'm such a lyrics guy, it has to be a good lyricist, it's gotta be a good, one of the guys that, I'm telling you hands down, if you've never heard of Andy Gullivar, he's a songwriter out of Nashville, and this guy writes songs, and then within three minutes, I'm not kidding, he takes you from laughing to tears, like, just like the subtle reality of what the song is about, and, how did I not write that? You know, it's it's those things, but the guy's been doing it for years. Um, and he is probably, hands down, he's my favorite songwriter right now because he writes songs that are so accessible and so real. The way he writes his songs are very, there's a natural progression to all of them, but it's just, it's probably some of the richest lyrics as far as 
it's not Chesterton or anything like that. It's not, you know, C.S. Lewis. It's not that heady stuff, but it is so heady that it's just like the gravity of it. Just, I remember I was like reduced to tears. I was driving around. I was like, how, you know? And you can't copy that stuff. You can't copy that stuff. That stuff's, he has cornered the market on something that I don't want to try to duplicate because it's, it's so unique and beautiful that I don't want to duplicate that. I want to enjoy that for what it is. And I think what happens to a lot of songwriters is they latch onto Dylan or they latch onto other songwriters and they try to write Dylan-esque lyrics or they try to write and they don't find their own voice. I remember years ago, Dave Matthews was huge and he had these certain ways he would write these lyrics. And I go on these message boards when the internet was very infantile uh, and, and, and it just kind of had just started booming. I mean, you could see these forums and stuff like that, these chat rooms or these message boards. And these people would post their lyrics and they're direct ripoffs of Dave Matthews. Hey, I wrote this song and it's all the same wording and phrasing that Dave Matthews and I'm like, and then that used to make me mad and I had just started doing music. I just started writing songs. I didn't know a lot of the things I know now about songwriting. Um, and I'm thinking, even I could tell that was a really, really bad attempt to write something, and I'm thinking, find your own voice. You have your own thoughts, you can find your own voice. But even then it was kind of like, I didn't realize at that point, you know, how hard it is to be an individual when you're writing songs. And a lot of that just comes from doing it. Tell me what you do at the Song Writers Association. Okay, so probably about, uh, I'll go back to the beginning. In 2011 or 12, I kind of, there wasn't anywhere to play. Chattanooga was kind of, grown a lot now in the past five, six years where there are more opportunities to play. But there really wasn't any opportunity to play anywhere. And I was, there was an article on the local, in the local paper here in, in town and they, there was a songwriters association that started and they were actually taking applications. They had like three or four like songwriters nights. They were kind of like miniature songwriter rounds in different uh, venues in the area. So I just filled out an application to do that. And um, I ended up playing my first writers night. I think it was like November of 2011 or 12. I think it was. I think it was 2011. And um, I ended up becoming friends with the, the gentleman who was over the Songwriters Association. And um, and uh, ended up, he ended up, and probably about May of 2013, right around that time, he ended up stepping down and asked me if I would take over. So when I took over, uh, for me, the biggest thing was the things that I had grown from in the last two years being kind of hanging out in the association was that community aspect. And so what, when I came into you know leadership role, it was what are the things that are most important to me, which is writing songs that I'm proud of. Because that's where I was at. I was at that point where I finally was like, you know, I've been doing this for almost, for over 10 years. And I'm just at the point now where I'm writing songs that I'm like, I'll go play those songs for somebody. Uh, and I was really proud of those songs. And so that was, has been the goal the whole time now is just, you know, finding songwriters that are, you know, and just encouraging them. That was the big thing with the CSA was, and it's now this, you know, our, at least for me, that's the vision for the CSA is being a resource hub for other songwriters. You know, if you need, uh, you know, if you need assistance finding something, you know, some avenue for your song as far as like, you know, what do I need, you know, as far as like PROs, like BMI and ASCAP, you know, we've got a resource section on our website and just designing those things to be user friendly for the songwriters. And even, even though we're an association, we don't have a membership base where, you know, we have paid membership or anything like that. We don't have anything set up like that. We just want to be a resource hub to the community here. And uh, we're, where we're at right now, it's called the Heritage House Arts and Civic Center. And every month we have a writer's night. It's just kind of like a small part of what we do at the CSA. It's kind of like a miniature house concert series where the city sponsors it, so nobody has to pay. It's free admission. It's in the middle of Heritage Park out here in East Brainerd. And um, I have a board of directors. I have about five or six board of directors, and each one of them are independent songwriters. And so they host every month. We all kind of host, and they'll bring in people, you know, songwriters, or we'll have you know some songwriters that are you know on standby, and uh, we bring them in to have them you know play and. Uh, the city has been wonderful about supporting us. This is, makes our, I think, our fifth year we've been doing it here, fourth or fifth year that we've been doing it here at the Heritage House. And, um, it's the only place we have an event, um, and it may not, it may be the only place we do for a while, just because the focus, we uh, really want to make sure that the focus is on the teaching aspect and the educational resources that we can offer. And we're trying to build that and hopefully partner with some other organizations in the area just to kind of 
make sure that you know where there's a need that we're at least trying to fill that need. Uh, we're not going to critique people's songs or anything like that. You know, we're just we're here as an encouragement center for you. If you're a songwriter and, and you know you're like, I want to know, I want to get my songs critiqued. Well, we'll try to find a place to, for you to send your songs. So you can get those songs critiqued and get that growth and development you want, uh, that you need. So uh, a friend of mine, his name is Tom Payton, and uh, here's an example of, of endurance in songwriting. So a really good friend of mine, his name is Tom Payton, he used to write for Rima McIntyre. He's one of the, the first songwriters she had on the publishing label. I had, a, I had a song I was working on about a year ago in March, and uh, I, sent him, I sent him like a rough work tape of it. I said, you know, what do you think about this? And the song was titled, I Wish That I Was Him. It's probably one of the most personal songs I've ever written. And he, uh, usually he would email me back and say, you know, that's great, or, you know, I've got some ideas. And he just called me, and it's not like him to ever just call me. So he calls me and he's like, leaves a message. And all he said was, you got a song. So I call him back and we're talking. He says, you got a great song. He goes, don't screw it up. And of course, I'm petrified at that point because I'm like, okay, uh, you know. And he said, because if you finish this and it's a good song, he goes, I think if, if you can get this right, he goes, somebody's going to cut the songs. Of course, my mind shifts to getting a song cut and not finishing the song. So I put it down for like a year and didn't touch it. And I was petrified to do it because I was like, you know, what if I mess this up? What if I screw this up? And I finally, after about a year, and this was March of last year, so March or April this year, I was like, I gotta finish it. So I sat down and just put in put in the work on it. And I had been very lazy in doing that with other songs. And I think it got to the point where I was such a perfectionist about it that I was afraid. I was afraid to write anything because I don't want to waste good music on really crappy lyrics. And I don't know if you're ever like that or not. If you get a really nice piece of music, you're like, I don't want to screw this up. You know, this is yeah. so good. I don't want to have to repurpose because I'm have the hardest repurposing melodies. Mm -hmm. It's like once once the lyric is written for this melody, that's it. They're they're married to forever. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're grown old together. They're not going to do that. And there's some song that's like you know I just repurpose the music. I'm like how do you do that? Yeah. But I finished that song and uh, I played it a couple times and and even if it doesn't get cut, I had to get past that point to where I was like you know. Even if it doesn't get cut, this is something that I need to write for me. This is therapy for me, which I don't have a lot of those where I'm like, this is therapy for me. Um, but this one was like, this is something I got to say. I've only had a couple of those where I'm like, this is something I got to say. Um, and it doesn't come across as just bad, just cliche, just bad. Because if you've ever been, listened to songs that are like that, you know, you, you get up there and you're like, I know what's coming next. I just, I just know what's coming next. What advice would you give a new songwriter? Listen to other songwriters, especially ones that are seasoned. Now, I don't, you know, I think, and I was telling a friend of mine, I think every songwriter has something to offer. You know, you know, whether you're new or old, there's different perspectives in your journey as a songwriter. But I would say, you know, be be slow, you know, slow to dismiss things. You know, chew on those things and and listen to other songwriters, especially ones that have been doing it for a while. Because they may have a perspective. Don't be scared to co-write. You know, you can be selective. You know, you, just in anything you can you, in your life, you can be selective with who you hang out with or whatever. But you know, if somebody's a good hang, if somebody's a cool hang, you know, as far as like if you you can go and just hang out with somebody, you don't have to do music, but they actually are a songwriter. That's probably going to be a, a really good indicator that you're going to probably have a good co-writing relationship. Um, also, writers try to write a lot of songs, and I'm a horrible. I'm horrible advice on that, so I'm just going to be straight up here. Try to write a lot of songs, that way they become less like your children. So when somebody says something bad about your song, it doesn't hurt as much. <laughs> it's the truth, though, because what happens, and I, I can attest to that, because I remember writing songs and somebody wouldn't necessarily care for it, and it would feel like somebody was just, just right in the back, just stabbed right in the back. And then I, I, as I got to the point where I was writing songs, and I said something earlier, I had a friend of mine say, how do you write what something do you think is a good uh, is a good key to writing songs? And I said, take yourself out of the song if you can. Take yourself out of the song, and that may mean if you are going through something that's just really taxing, give it some time before you try to write. Don't try to write when you're in that moment. Get you get to the point where you're you, you've healed 
it's you know, if it's a breakup, a divorce, you know, a death of someone, try not to write it at that specific time. Give it some time so you can actually feel like you're stepping out of that, and it's kind of like you're you're giving a third person perspective. Um, if you can do that, um, that's a good that's a good thing because then you're able to be unbiased when you write the song. Um, also, a big thing songwriters say: if you have a character in your story, write them in a good perspective, a good light. You know, don't write your you know you want people to like the character in your song. You know. The main character, their you know Carrie Underwood song, you know, or the, before he cheats or the next time he cheats or whatever, when he cheats, I don't know that song. It's I just remember Louisville Slugger. So anyway, uh, but you know she paints herself as the victim, and then there's a bad, there's a villain in the song. It's that guy, and so you know those are some different perspectives. But you know everybody wants to relate to the character, and nobody wants to relate to someone who just bashes themselves. That's you know. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's different for, for different songwriters because I feel like one of the best songs that I've, I've written was when I was in the midst of it. Really? Yeah. Um, then just I, axed that last thing I said. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm no, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that, that's okay. That's one of the cool things about this podcast. Um, I'll say that it's never worked for me, and I, and I should I should have prefaced it that way. That, it's never worked for me. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like it's it's cool to get different perspectives from from different musicians you know yeah. it might not work for you um i know it's worked for me at least once yeah um but i i i, I will say i i think that i wasn't able to like polish it and finish it off until i was in a place where i okay. was okay with it yeah. you know but the emotion yeah i feel like was captured better because i was in the midst yeah of it. yeah um, the big the bulk of the song, um, but no, that's good. Now don't take it back. Don't take it back. I mean, there might be a songwriter. Yeah, to this. I just know for for me at least, it's easier to write. Of course, I'm looking at it from a commercial perspective. Um, I write for a publishing company, so I'm always looking at. Um, I'm looking at marketability. Mm. That's not my main focus because that'll drive me nuts. Because what's marketable now is not going to be marketable. In thirty minutes, probably. So mm -hmm. you know, that's you know, if you're trying to write, and I did that. I tried to, um, I tried to at one time, and I was miserable. I was so miserable. And again, if it's your job, if that's what you do every day, you that's what you're doing. But for me, it didn't work. And luckily, you know, the publishing deal I have is, is I, I'm a staff writer, but it's not my full time job. So it's not something I'm like going into a writer's room every day and be like eight hours in just trying to write. As much as I can, right. um, I can kind of be a little bit more selective about the co-writes and stuff, and, and working into the schedule I have. And it seems more, it, for me at least, it's a little bit more relaxing. I don't feel like I've got to make it work. I don't have to have twelve individual rights by the end of the year and have them demoted and everything. You know, I have a lot of lax. I'm very have a lot of leeway, which is really good for me. Um, but I don't. I, for me, it, it, it was. For me, there will be a lot of unhealthy language and it came out of the song. If mm -hmm. I if I if I were to write it in that moment and just be like, I'm done. Because that's what a lot of songwriters do. They're angry, they're upset about something or whatever, they feel a certain way, and they'll write the song and then they're done. And that's why that's why I try to tell people and teach them, edit your songs. Go back and edit your song. You know, if you're someone who can write a, a masterpiece in 45 minutes, and there are some people that can do that. I'm not one of those guys. For me, it's healthy to go back and edit just because you're getting the, the cadence, you're getting the rhythm of the song, you're getting a lot of that stuff. You're tying up those loose ends. My friend Drakeford says, you're sanding down the edges. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's at least for me, but some people do better when they're in the middle of, you know, heartbreak or, or you know, a specific situation just to get it out. And then they're done with it. And, you know, they're Ron Adams and they write really great songs. <laughs> I think some of my favorite songwriters are the ones that make you feel less alone. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of my, one of my, I guess the best way you can describe it is, is um, and there are songwriters out there who are like, God, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the one that's feeling this way. I, had, I have a song that's on that, that last album. It's the very last track on the record. And uh, I wrote that song about, I wrote that song, it, it was like the first verse was just like, Something I, I had actually woke up in the middle and I was like, and it was a, it was a story about a person who I knew 
was moving away, and uh, and and it, it got me thinking about you know as far as like all the decisions that we make and how sometimes we subconsciously make decisions that are best for us in the long run and best for the other person in the long run. And that can be friendship. That can be a, a love relationship, anything like that. And uh, it was like, it's, it's called some birds. And um, it was like, you know, some birds are meant to cage and some are meant, you know, to fly away. I don't think anybody's meant to cage. And, and it was like, you know what? Possibly, you know, the choice was mine to free the bird before it settled for the cage. And that's probably one of the most personal songs because I was, I really spent a lot of time on that song. And I remember the moment I was, I was sitting at work. I used to work for eight hours a day. I think that was something I missed. I'd have my notepad up on my computer and just work lyric, and I would, and I remember them. I was sitting at work, and I was stuck. I was like, "Where? What am I trying to say here? I know what I want to say, but how, how am I supposed to say this?" And I remember when it hit me, it was like that somebody just dumped cold water on me. Huh. That's what I'm supposed to say. And it was like at that moment, I was like, "This is a good song." And a lot of times, I think as a songwriter, you can probably attest to this too. When you know, because people ask you, I at least ask me, how do you know when a song is finished? And it's hard to put that and quantify that into words. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I tell them, you'll know. There's no holes in the story. For, for me, at least, when, when I'm listening to songwriters, and I'm, I'm listening to them, and knowing they put in the work, and how they shape a lyric, to me, is probably one of the most satisfying things. Uh, but but if if you're like if you're like me, when somebody asks you how how do you know when a song's done and you say I know it's done, is at least at least for me is if I'm sitting there and it's and it's it's not a you know a, a up and you know it's not an upbeat song. A lot of songs are not really like that. Um, and and it, especially if it's if it's something that's meant to move you. And I'm sitting there, and I can't even get to the lyric because I'm choked up. For me, at least, I know that's probably going to translate, either in the performance or just in the lyric. Even if that song doesn't get cut by anybody, you know, and I'll be happy if somebody you know does. But if it doesn't get cut by anybody, at, at least I know that on some level somebody's resonating with it. It's, it's it's hitting somebody. And I think most songs that you hear that are standards or things, they're resonating with somebody. And, and for, for me, that's the thing with any artist is, is are, you, are you doing records? Are you making records that are just, you got a couple singles and then you got a lot of filler? Or are you making your records with the intention to make every single, every, every single song count? You know, I've got songs that I put on this last record because I'm like, I don't think they fit this record. I don't know if I'll put them on another record. You know, so. But I, 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 I think... If you're going to tell a songwriter, you know, the advice I would give songwriters, you know, if you're just starting out is find resources that are going to help you grow as a songwriter and don't spend 10 years like I did figuring, trying to figure it out. Don't do that. If you've, there's too many resources that, that are out there that are on the internet, YouTube, I mean, everything, I don't know about YouTube, but um, there are way too many resources that are available to you that are free that you should take advantage of for you not to take advantage of. Um, and if you're not taking advantage of those, you're just being lazy. That's just plain and simple. And I'm speaking from, I said this to somebody before, I said, uh, I am more apt to lay on my couch and eat a box of donuts than pick up my guitar that's across the room and work on there. So don't be like me. <laughs> you know, don't be afraid to work lyric, you know, and, and grow and grow your vocabulary and, and do the things that you do the things and do the work necessary so you know like the ant you're not starving during the winter time <laughs> do the work during the summertime you know and then you're the ant that gets to eat during the winter time and you're not was it the grasshopper <laughs> does it the story the grasshopper yeah, played all summer and then starves during yeah. the winter time yeah. so anyway tell me about a song that you you had to fight to write something that you were just mulling over for a long time and how did you bring it full circle if you if you have one that comes to mind uh oh yeah yeah it's the one i mentioned 
uh, that I sat on for like a year. So, so, and I can break down the song. It's hard. It's hard because I know what's going on up here, but it is so hard to verbalize that. So I'll just walk you through basically. So this the song with the central character was basically um, the central idea was it was about uh, it was about my my oldest daughter and the relationship I have with her, but also the relationship she has with her her biological father. And so the way the story is set up. Um, was I had the first verse and the second verse, because the way I would pair it would basically be like a, a verse, verse, the chorus, verse, bridge, and chorus. So I had stuck, so I had the first two verses, and I had this the chorus in, but there was one little section I was like, I, I can't figure out what I want to put there. It was just a word. So I sat on that, and then I moved on to this third verse. Now the problem with the third verse is, and a lot of people have problems with this, is Where's the progression in the story? So what happens a lot of times, at least for me, was I started naming individual events in her life that hadn't happened that were going that I could think this is going to happen. So I had she's getting married, she's gonna be driving a car, she's going off to college. So I had all these little things. So I'm trying to squeeze all these details into four bars. That specific section was very scattered. It was I've got all these different details. I've got four different details here. And what really broke, what really broke that wall, that barrier I had mentally there, that block was, I, I had a conversation with myself and I remember it. I sat and said, Anthony, what are you trying to say here? What are you actually trying to say here? Because you're saying a lot of things, but w what are you saying? And so I had this last line. I was like, I can use that. That's my turn. That's my turn that's going to get me back into that chorus and so what I did was I focused on just one of those aspects it was the wedding day and because that's kind of like the centralized theme if you have a daughter she's going to get married at least that's what your, your hopes are she's going to get married and she's going to have kids and she's going to be a church wedding and all those things so here was this chorus and then what that did was it opened up for if I wanted to use a bridge and so a lot of times people are like you know they feel like they have to use a bridge because that's the thing you do is you add a bridge even if it doesn't Add to the song, your bridge, at least somebody has told me, is at least what it's explained to me, your bridge is where you, is the bow. It's the bow on the present that ties everything together. And so for me it was, I'm having this, this crisis in here. I'm having this crisis in here. This is how I feel. This is what I see. So I'm telling things I see. And so I get to that chorus and it says, I wish that I was him. So then we get to this, the third verse. And these are things that are, possibly going to happen. So I phrase it in a way that's future tense because we're not there yet. And so then we get to that bridge and it's like, what am I trying to say with this whole thing? And the bridge for me was, I'm trying to say, even though I'm not your biological father, I hope someday she understands, I love you just like you're mine. That's it. There's no conclusion. To, there's no, it's, I don't have any re resolution to this. There's no resolve to the storyline. But the idea is not necessarily about you or her as much as it is about how I feel she perceives me. And that's one of those things where it's very open-ended because I may never know. I may never know. She may never hear the song. I don't know how she's going to react to it. But this is how I feel. And in the moment when I was writing, and that's where I'll, I'll go back to saying, for me, it was very hard for me to write in that moment, because I, for some reason, you know, now she's almost 18. All this stuff is from when she was three up, so 15 years of being with her. And I'm trying to summarize, and somehow it hits me like a heavy load of brick. And I'm trying to take, in a year ago, trying to digest every single bit of that. So in that moment, I couldn't digest it. It was just way too much. So it literally took me a year to digest, step away from it, go back to it, step away from it. It was kind of like I couldn't dance with that at that moment. There was no way I could dance in that in, dance at, at that moment. So I had to step away, learn how to dance a little bit better so I could go back into it and acclimate myself to the song. So when I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, let's give this another shot. Let's look at the perspective. I was able to look at it in a different perspective and not be afraid and it could be that I'm getting older. A year doesn't seem that long. 
Three months doesn't seem that long. Three months goes like that. So for me, now I can wait on a song for a year. If it's going to be good, if it's gonna, if I feel like it's going to be what it needs to be, I can wait on that song for a year because guess what? I waited two and a half years to finish a record. It took me two and a half years to finish this last record. It didn't seem like two and a half years. And now we're a year removed from that, and it doesn't seem like a year. So my perspective on time has changed to where I'm not afraid to sit on something for a year if it's worth it. So that was that was that natural progression in, into writing that song was fighting for those lyrics and asking myself the tough question, which was, what are you trying to say here? And at that point, it was um, when I got to the point where I was able to finish it, then I send it to uh, some people that I respect. And one of the guys was like, that's it. That's it. And, and so for me, that was solidifying, okay, we're done with this. You know, and then it was time to go, okay, let's go play it, you know, and see how, is it, how you know, what the response is for it.